Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you want to increase your creativity, one way to do that can be by doing mundane everyday tasks like copying numbers from a phone book. Doing boring tasks actually allows your mind more time to daydream, which can let you be more creative at the next thing you tackle. And that may sound a little bit weird, but I spent about four or five years putting auto parts in boxes during summers to pay for college in addition to my entrepreneurial efforts. So I would literally look at a sheet of paper, look at a 10 digit number, look at a shelf, and then pull that number of gaskets off the shelf all day, every day. And my mind would just go crazy places, but that was actually good for creativity. I'm not suggesting that you bore that guy yourself, but hey, maybe there's something to this idea that a repetitive task like chopping wood or carrying water, as the Buddhists would like to say, could be good for you when you're doing something creative. Today's guest is a philosopher, best-selling author, and uh, some people would say an enlightened hooligan. He speaks around the world about the importance of overcoming personal obstacles, getting clarity, and cultivating confidence. And this guy shared stages with a few people you may have heard of, guys like Stephen Covey, Richard Branson, and the Dalai Lama, as well as some Olympic athletes, TV personalities, and entrepreneurs. This is none other than Philip McKernan. Philip, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Dave? Great to be here. Uh, there's so, much, so many things I want to ask you here, uh, but one of the first things I want to ask you about is that you're dyslexic and you've written four books, which is awesome. Uh, I've spent a good amount of time working with you know, people on the autistic spectrum and understanding how the brain works because by all rights, according to my visual training people, I should have been dyslexic, but I'm not. But you've seen my orange glasses probably. Those have to do with visual processing as well. How did you hack your dyslexia to be able to write four books? Like, There's lots of people who care about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I mean, how did I hack that? Um, I, I just the biggest, the biggest thing I had to overcome was just the personal kind of, um, you, you know, the the inadequacy I had around not being able to read like everybody else. So I'd love to say I had a three point process. It took me like a day or a half a day or or whatever. Maybe I'm just completely slow, but it took me many years. And and honestly, I can truthfully say I still haven't fully gotten over it. But I think one of the, there's nothing else that I often say about myself when people give me compliments and speak about me and. Quite honestly, I think they give me way too much, you know, kind of credibility for a lot of the stuff I say or do. But the one thing I will say is the only thing I'm very, very, very good at is taking action. And um, I always remember when I got approached by the first major publisher called John Wiley, and they sent me an email and they said, uh, we, we saw you speak, we, 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 we're we buying into you, we want you to write a book, uh, we're thinking of this book, are you in? And I remember just hitting, hitting reply, writing Y-E-S, hitting send, and the first thing that hit me was fuck. And uh, excuse the language, I'm not sure that you can edit that afterwards, but that's what happened. And the fear was overwhelming. I literally wanted to vomit on the spot. But to be fair, I found some sort of place in my heart or my head or whatever just to say yes, to step in. And that was the beginning of it. So have I hacked it completely? No. But, but to, to your credit, you didn't type E-Y-S. Yes, so, exactly. <laughs> well, well, I must go back and check the email. I mean, maybe, maybe it's spelled incorrectly. I've had a couple of embarrassing ones along the way, I have to say. Uh, that that's remarkable. So you just jumped in with both feet. You're a little bit stressed, but like, all right, I'm just going to do it. And were there any any particular things that you did just in order to get it out? I mean, I, I just finished the bulletproof diet manuscript uh, with with Rodale, and I'm sending it in. Uh, fortunately, I, I'm good at writing. I, I've didn't used to be good. I used to procrastinate terribly, but over the course of time, I've gotten to the point where I can just bring it and nail it. But what what process did you put in place in order to you know, generate the knowledge and, and really the good quality books that you've written? Like, like did you have you know, ghostwriters, copywriters, helpers? Did you do some weird meditation? Like, you know, you, you have to have something you did. Yeah, and all a bit of all of the above. I mean, I had a team around me, but actually, you brought up something really interesting because. When you think about what I've been offered, like I was offered, a, say, a book publishing deal with a large publisher, and they gave me a hell of a deal, right? And it was a book and, a, 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 you know, a, a, a kind of a previous chapter of my, life, of my life, excuse the pun, the first two books were about real estate and wealth building. And now I've moved into a slightly different phase of my life, but kind of evolving. But, but going back to that, I think it would have been so easy for me to say, oh, hang on, I'm dyslexic. So, so no, thank you. Or listen, I appreciate the offer, but it's not a fit for me. But, and allow my fear to speak for me. But because I said yes, and because I stepped into it, then the conversation happened. And then it opened a door for me to share one piece of open honesty. And I went to the publisher and said, yes, I'll do it. 
but I want to be really, really clear with you. I'm dyslexic. I was mortified. I was embarrassed. And I'm dyslexic, and I was almost like expecting them to go, oh, really? Oh, 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 listen, take care, look after yourself. But they went, we don't care. Thanks for being honest with us. Thanks for being upfront with us. We're going to build a team around you, and we're going to pay for all of it in order to support getting the book out of you. We're not after your writing skills. We're after what you believe and what you stand for. That, that's remarkable, and and you're not alone in in being a really successful person who has stuff like that. I, I remember when uh, John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco, uh, some kid in the audience had had a hard time and sort of started stumbling, and and without any preparation, uh, Chambers was like, "Actually, I have a learning disability too." And, and you know, all the the journalists sort of gasped, and he sort of quote came out of the closet. So there's lots of people who are kicking ass who are neurologically unique, we'll just put it that way. And it's, it's really cool to hear that when you talk to the publisher, they didn't you know, just get, get scared. They said, all right, like no big deal. And I think that in today's world, because of the internet, because of media and all, the things that used to be kind of like embarrassing like that are just like, hey, they're more common than they used to be because our general health as a society is going down. But also, it's just become something that we talk about and it's something that, that doesn't have stigma associated with it that it would have when you and I were you know, 20 plus years ago uh, going to school. Absolutely. Uh, so how does all this tie into running from elephants in Nigeria? Because I know you've done that too and there's got to be a connection. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, there might be, but we need a long, long time on that one. Or I'll put you on pause and I'll come back to you in about two hours. Uh, I've had the weirdest weirdest eclectic mix of not just business uh, involvements but life experiences and, and and I will honestly say and I say this regularly to people who know me personally I feel like I've lived three lives I've traveled to well over 70 countries around the world I've put myself in the weirdest positions and yes got ran down by an elephant in Nigeria and I and I really people laugh and joke about it but I can tell you one thing it was that close to death it was wow. so close. And in actual fact, it wasn't so much later in life that, you know, I started really because what did that what did that do for me other than allow me to really understand what absolute fear is and, and facing your own mortality in essence. But I think when you face your own mortality, not I'm suggesting your listeners and viewers should go and stand on the edge of the cliff and, and try to face it. But I think what it does, it allows you to kind of free yourself a little bit more and take a bit more risk because you've come so close. I mean, I was within feet of him tripping me, but big bull elephant full size. And if I went to the ground uh, and I didn't get back to, and I basically jumped under this car to stop the elephant get me. If I didn't get there um, within, within, a, within a moment or two, he was, I, was, I was caught and I was dead. I was, it was over. What did you do to piss off the elephant? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> uh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm very good at pissing people off. A lot of my clients <laughs> would say I pissed them off because I don't tell people what they want to hear all the time. The elephant, uh, I mean, honestly, it was just one of those things where yeah. I thought I was in a zoo. I was in a wildlife reserve, which was very poorly run and everything else. No responsibility in anybody other than this idiot here. I was wearing multicolored shorts and t-shirts. I thought I was in a zoo and I was walking up going, oh, there's a calf elephant, there's a bull elephant. I was taking photographs. The elephant was waving its ears, getting really frustrated. I thought, oh, you know, it's really friendly. And of course, <laughs> then it just went for me. Now, I was young and I was stupid. I'm maybe older and stupid now, but... Um, just getting too close to its baby, and I pissed it off, and, and rightly so, it, it protected its face. Well, I'm glad you made it. Now, this was after you were a caddy for the president of Ireland, right? Yes, correct. Oh, you've done your research. Um, <laughs> I did. I caddied for the president. Uh, for those of you who don't know what caddying is, uh, lifting, basically carrying his set of clubs or pulling his clubs for uh, 18 holes of golf, which sounds like a, a job that uh, is not that fun. But basically, a caddy's job is really to support the player and challenge the player and question the player, of course, which I didn't do too much later in the round because I was too nervous and too scared about who this man was and, and essentially what he represented. So if people listening haven't figured out yet, you've lived a, a pretty eclectic, unusual life. And somehow you took all of these things and you turned it into a career as a successful multiple book author uh, and a, a public speaker with some of the, the most influential and powerful and, and interesting people on earth. How did you make that, that how did you make all this come together? Like, like was there intent behind it? Did it just kind of happen? I, I think a lot of people who who are interested in success as a practice would just love to know what you did. 
Yeah, I think it was a bit of accident as well. I mean, just going back to the president's story, it wasn't until the, I think it was the 15th hole where the president was playing pretty, pretty, he's a great golfer, or he was a very good golfer, um, but he was just mishitting his shots, and he was basically hitting them too far, hitting them too low, or, or too short, I should say, and I, I basically turned around and, and, and challenged him, and he said, listen, I'm going to hit a, a hit a, a, you know, an eight iron, I think he said, into the 15th, and I said, Mr. President, you're going to need a, not, a, a seven iron. For those non-golfers, that's essentially saying you're not good enough to hit an eight iron that far, and he looked at me, and uh, uh, and, and I just, in that moment, I just went, oh, no, why don't you just shut your mouth? Why don't you just say nothing? All you do is three more holes, and you are gone. You are out of there. And, of course, he nails it to pin high, three or four feet from the hole, and looks at me as if to say, where the hell have you been all day? And I think that is really indicative of my life and my story, is that so much of my life was trying to fit in and trying to, trying to fit in with everybody else. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want to be dyslexic. I didn't want to be weird. And now I spent the rest of my life, much later in life, under, trying to understand my oddness and actually embracing that. And I think that's been a huge learning curve for me, finding my voice, trusting my own intuition. But if I had to bring it back to one incident, I think what um, was the best man speech in Ireland, where I was asked to be the best man for um, one of my closest friends. I was very fortunate to be asked again by my brother and then again by another friend. And on each occasion, uh, I got a standing ovation. And now you don't get standing ovations at weddings typically. It's a bit weird. It was very awkward for me. But a complete stranger approached me and said, you know, you, you, you need to be speaking. You need to do this. And, and it was a bit of a catalyst for me. It was a bit of a shift that I, sometimes your family can tell you something that they feel you need to do. But sometimes it takes a complete stranger to, to, to unlock something in you. And that was the beginning of it. Wow. So you just stood up and told your story and uh, did it well. And, and it sort of brought things out. You have a new book. Uh, that's was just released uh, a couple months ago. Rich on paper, poor on life: three paths to meaning and money. Uh, Correct. Sounds like pretty important stuff. In fact, it is. So, what's the basic premise of the book? Uh, I think the basic premise was was inspired by my own upbringing in the Celtic Tiger times, and the Celtic Tiger is the economic boom that Ireland experienced uh, in the in the early nineties, and. Ireland went from one of the poorest countries in Europe to the second wealthiest country on the planet in a space for about 11 years, which was, is extraordinary in the context of economics and, um, and, and timelines and time frames. The, the challenge in that space and that time as people made hay while the sunshine, so to speak, chased the economic um, realities, chased the money, assuming that it would give them the freedom and the happiness, is they let go of their health. They let go of their, their social outlets. They let, look, let go of their relationships. They took them for granted and assumed they'd be there at the end of this big, uh, this big boom. So that's been a huge inspirational part of this is that I don't just see it in Ireland, but I see it around the world where people put money very much front and center. And even though they'll tell you they don't, they really put a huge value on money. So the idea is that, and, and, and the premise is that I think that we're chasing happiness often, and I think it's a bit of an illusion. I think if we can bring meaning into our lives, the byproduct of that is happiness. And basically, the basic premise of it down in, in the book is that we need to be deriving meaning in the three areas of our life, the work that we do the relationship with ourselves and the relationship with other people. And it just illustrates real life stories of how ordinary people did that. I hate to call them ordinary, but not like well-known stars, just real people and how they made some of those shifts. Well, let's face it, most of us aren't Richard Branson, right? So if, if you're using that as your yardstick, things are different. So yeah, uh, so the, the rest of us uh, who, who maybe haven't had that level of success, but still care. It, I, and that's an interesting point, Dave, is the relatability. Is, is really important that sometimes people get inspired by somebody who has an island and has many, many businesses, not to take away from what he did, but the relatability and therefore the chasm, the gap between what they've achieved and what we're, where we are right now is often so, it's so difficult to kind of comprehend that. And that's a really important part is illustrating change from people who are everyday people, if you like. I, I deal with that uh, personally. I, I disclosed uh, a while back that when I was 26 years old, I made $6 million in the dot-com boom. And yeah, I put my health completely on hold. Like who needs health when you're making millions of dollars as a young man? No one ever hears the part where I lost it when I was 28, <laughs> when, <laughs> when everything came back down. It's like I've been working my butt off uh, for all this time, supporting a family, you know, working in a cubicle and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well on my path of biohacking and, and improvement and all that. And it's only been, what, nine months that I've been full-time bulletproof. The rest of the time I was a VP at a big company working hard, you know, flying around doing what VPs do. And, and that relatability thing is really important because 
even the other guests on, on my show, I, everyone's a normal person who deals with normal things with varying levels of success. Some of them run small gyms, others of them are research scientists, and others are really successful entrepreneurs, but it doesn't really matter. All of us face the same basic challenges. Some of us have more tools to try and outsource parts of them, but it, it's kind of the same thing. Mm. Absolutely. And, and interestingly enough is that the ironic thing is that when you start to, as I call it, look, look at your life off the ice, and you start looking at those relationships, you start getting meaning from, from, your, from the relationship with yourself, you start really reconciling some of those issues that you carry and some of those judgments that you, have, you carry and those expectations that you carry and you're dealing with internal stuff and you start looking at you know, maybe either doing something different that you, for what you do for a day-to-day -day work point of view or changing the way you do it to bring some more meaning into it. The ironic thing is the money follows. And I know it's an old cliche, do your passion, money follows and all that. And that pisses me off sometimes because it's not entirely delivered in the right way. But the, the clients that, that have started to do this, the money that they're making, but it's the money, they don't define themselves by what they make and they're not defining themselves by what they do. What they do is just an expression of who they are. Where in Ireland and around the world, I see people have become what they do which is so sad because it becomes one of the first questions at a dinner party. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dave, how do you do? So what do you do? What do you do? It's almost like we need to know what you do in order to put you in a box, which I think is, is, is sad. What do you answer when people say, what do you do? Uh, well, it's an ongoing joke on a professional <laughs> level. Uh, what does Philip McKernan actually do? And, and how do you describe it? And my wife came in one of my retreats to Ireland. Would you believe this? And at the end of the retreat, someone says, now you have a better sense of, of how to describe Philip's work. And she goes... I'm more, not confused, she says, I'm, I'm more unable to just put it down in one word, in one, one kind of sentence. Um, but I suppose really it comes down to like, you know, just basically what do I do? I, I help people create more meaning in their lives and, and make money at the same time because I'm, 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 I'm about the money, but it, the money should be put in its place. And uh, that's the important piece. I, I never know to say it at a, at a dinner party either. I, like, what do you do? I'm like, I, I don't know. Uh, like, I help people in various ways, like the number one ranked health podcast. But there's also this coffee thing and, oh, brain hacking. And, and it's like, I don't know, like, whatever helps people and whatever helps me, I tend to take this, test it here and put it out there. There's, there aren't words for that. Uh, and if there are words for what you do and you like that, that's cool. But if, if there aren't words, maybe there don't need to be words. No, and I've been okay with that. I think yeah. there's a little bit of mystery, and I think then people go delving. If people have, you know, if you speak on a stage and people kind of resonate with you, they'll, they'll, they'll find a way to you, and like yourself. And, and, and the feeling I get from you, and maybe I'm wrong, is the sense I get from you having only, you know, met you briefly a couple of times and, yeah. and looking into your stuff is that you're not consumed by what the consumer wants. What I, what I get from you, and maybe I'm wrong, is that you, you give people, you, you develop stuff that you honestly think people need. And I think there's something really cool about that where people keep saying to me, why don't to go out to your clients and ask them what they want and everything else and I don't give them what they want because what I do is I'm all about creating experiences and challenges and questions that I believe that people need uh, people don't want this you know the book that I wrote rich in paper poor in life they don't want it necessarily but it's a message that really needs to be brought to the world yeah uh, doing what works is is more powerful than doing what people want and and there's that old kind of tired story you ask a tractor or tractor ask a I just gave away the punchline. You ask a farmer from a uh, hundred years ago, what do they want? They don't say a tractor. They say, I want a bigger horse that could pull a bigger plow. And, and so some crazy guy goes out there and says, well, screw this noise. I'm inventing a tractor because either it's what I want or it's what I think everyone wants. And those are the guys or women who totally transform things. Those are the disruptors. And I, I don't know how to not be a disruptor. It's just I don't know how I am. And I get a sense that you're like that as well. Like I, you're just going to do what what you think is right and funny enough when people realize that they can pursue meaning instead of pursuing a certain title or whatever else it is that it does it disrupts their life and that's what's cool about your book by by helping people see the power of focusing on meaning i think that you're doing more for them than they might recognize that's actually why i wanted you on the show mm, thank you thank you what about people's relationship with money? Is it dysfunctional? Is it functional? What, what do you tell your clients, especially the ones who go from where they are to 10 times bigger than that? Uh, what's, what's the secret there? I, 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 I honestly, there's not many things that surprise me in life. I, I have heard so many things. I almost would say I've heard it all. Probably not the very time that you hear something that you don't expect. But I... Over the last two years, I started to have the conversation about money. What does money mean to you? What is your relationship to money? Not about how do you make more and what you do with the money that you have. But like when you start studying the relationship to people and start bringing them through a process where you start to really understand their 
their their their you know their history with money, their how they grew up around money, what they feel about money, the charges they have around money. You know, what do they, they you know when you just even give them money and put it in a hammock, what what do you feel? What comes up? What emotions come up? It is absolutely extraordinary the dysfunctionality in money in society today and how it controls us. And here's the sad the sad piece, or here's the challenging piece. There will be people listening to this right now going, yeah, I can imagine. Actually, have got a friend, Tracy. Now, she is, oh, my God, she's got dysfunction. The people themselves don't know. There's an unawareness of how money drives us. And it's been one of the most fascinating, challenging, and extraordinary conversations I've had with people. And my clients range, range from, like, you know, range from billionaires, like the top 1%, some of the wealthiest families in America, who I can't mention the name, to people who literally don't have any billions, have minus hundreds of dollars, who are trying to get a business going, trying to get, you know, kind of take control of their life, etc. And the, the difference, the difference between the two is almost, it, it's, it's incredibly similar. I've had a woman literally sit in a room one day and go, guys, I'm hearing you all talking about not having enough money. I've got 100 million in the bank, and I'm telling you one thing, I'm as dysfunctional like the rest of you around money but I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective. So it doesn't matter whether you have or you don't have it, the dysfunctionality and our attachment and our emotion to money is extraordinary. And it often keeps us from actually bringing the money that we want into our lives, if that makes any sense. All right, so we just crossed into Hippieville. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps us from bringing the money we want into our lives. What does that really mean? All right, so I'm going to put on my, my barista. Actually, I wasn't a barista. I was a Baskin Robbins 31 Flavors scooping guy. I, I did that for a, a couple of years part time when I was in school. And uh, I could win arm wrestling every time because I had this big scooping muscle. But uh, going from that kind of a mindset where you're like, okay, I, I make a minimum wage uh, and I work pretty hard and I have a boss and I get X number of hours, how does how do you, from that mindset, how do you bring more money into your life? It, it, I know it feels like a quantum leap for, for people who are just getting started in their careers or people who are stuck. What, what unsticks them or what does, what does those words really mean? Yeah, I, I can't really speak to the people who are, you know, making minimum wage with respect. And it's not that I can't speak or don't want to speak to them. My clients tend to be entrepreneurs who have a business who are just struggling. So I would see them slightly differently. They're, they're, they're still people. But, you know, these are entrepreneurs who are, you know, getting by. They're covering their overheads and everything else. But they just yeah. haven't broken through in terms of that, you know, into profitability, into, you know, making it good and, you know, retained incomes within the business and, 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 and creating a business that, that actually is not controlling them. So that's really the 99% of it clients I'm working with. So it would be unfair okay. of me to try and speak to the other the other side of that that coin, so to speak. Okay. Um, often they, they've got the sales ability, they've got the marketing ability, they understand their business, they're they're aligned with their business to some extent. But there's there's old patterns about it's often what I see about people with um, I often see and again I don't work in the nutrition space and the diet space and the fitness space. I don't even claim to never bring it in to my work ever. But there's something really interesting happening in the community of people I work with is that they come in, they go through a lot of shit, they ch they're challenged to the core, they move through a lot of stuff, they get rid of a lot of stuff they've been carrying that they didn't, weren't aware of. They start to get really settled into their business. They start to kind of uh, start enjoying their business more. They start talking about their business in a way that they did. They start attracting clients that ordinarily would avoid them. And then they start to look at their bodies and they actually move from a place of feeling they have to go to the gym to wanting to go to the gym. They start to put a value on their own skin they start to really put a value on not just who they are as a person, but they start to feel they deserve the money they've been telling everybody that they've wanted. They start to feel they deserve the body that they've been telling themselves they wanted. And like if you have a, you have a person, a man or woman, and they're overweight, and you have a million people lined up, and one by one by one they walk in, they say, you're not overweight, you're not overweight, you're not overweight. And uh, this is maybe an area I didn't want to get into because it's a bit hippie, -ish, hippie, hippie -ville, if you like, as well. But... At the end of that millionth person, that person starts to actually think and they start going, maybe I'm not overweight, maybe I'm not. But they wake up the following morning feeling overweight, feeling ugly, feeling unworthy. And the difference is that internal shift. If you can have that, that's what I do. And if you can shift that, then they, they, they will give themselves permission to make the money that they're capable of making. There's no magic to it. It's a, it's a value thing, a deep rooted value thing. So, so when, when I was a, a young entrepreneur, and, and I've, I've had multiple entrepreneurial successes in my career, and, and I'll be real straightforward, I didn't get paid a lot of those when I should have been paid, for whatever reason. In fact, I know now, I, I was getting in my own way. I'm like, wait, we just sold that company for how many hundred million? And like, what did I take away from this? Like, nothing? Like, why did I put all these hours in? And there's various reasons for all these things. But 
you'll find that there are entrepreneurs who seem to be successful but don't make money. And, and there's something that they're doing there. And sometimes they just got screwed. Like, you know, there, there are con artists and various people like that out there. But in my own path of becoming um, not just a multiple time successful entrepreneur, but a multiple time successful entrepreneur who at least is self supporting and doesn't have a job at the same time I'm an entrepreneur, <laughs> um, there is something psychological uh, that's involved. For me, I did a lot of neurofeedback and became aware of you know, the messages I had inside my body and, and repatterned those things. What's the technique that you use with an entrepreneur who says, you know, keeping his head above water, but isn't where he wants to be to, to take him and accelerate his growth up, up to the next level? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example rather than try to speak around it in, in different ways. Sure. I mean, I had a lady very recently, one of the big transitions was she was in a business and an industry she didn't particularly like. So we had needed to identify that face reality and, of course, the fear of what's next. And, and literally, she's driving down the road one day, and you might think this is law of attraction. I'm not a big fan of that terminology, for maybe for obvious reasons. But she's driving down the road one day, and she heard an ad on the radio that probably played 50 times before, whatever, I don't know. But she heard it, and she said, shit, that, that's something I could see myself doing. So she ends up setting up this business, okay, and absolutely loving it to the point where she sat in a room one day with, with another group of entrepreneurs that I was working with. And when I said to her, tell me about your business, I want you to almost prove to me that this is the business you want to open up. This is the business you want to run. And she started to literally tear up as she spoke about the ramifications and the meaning that she would get from this business. And there wasn't one person in the room that was going to call bullshit. So the alignment was there. Great. She's doing her passion. She loves it and everything else. But of course, the big challenge that hits many entrepreneurs is, great, I'm doing my passion film but I'm just not making many money with it. And most people would go to the place of, okay, so what's your bottom line? Like, what are you doing from a marketing standpoint? Are you on Twitter and Facebook? And, you know, what's, you know, let's have a look at your lease and let's look, look at, you know, your sales channel and all this other stuff. And I just said to her, I said, um, talk to me a bit about your students and the people that are coming. So she works, she works with young kids in helping them with maths. And basically through maths, she helps them with personal confidence and everything else. And it, she just loves what she does. And she goes, well, I've got these kids and everything. I need disruptive kids. And she goes, well, I've got a few disruptive kids. And I said, so why are you keeping them? And she just goes, um, well, you know, I mean, you know, she didn't want to say no. She, she, she wanted everyone to like her. She has a scarcity mentality, which is driven from her history, her background, which is driven around money because there's never enough money. And um, so we started delving into that place. She agreed, and I tell you, Dave, this is not a bullshit story, right? She agreed on that day that she was going to get rid of two or three kids. Now, people would be here going, well, why, why didn't she talk to the parents? These were just disruptive kids. She's attempted to rationalize mm -hmm. and work, work with them. She went back. She got rid of the kids. She came back the following uh, three months later to the workshop, and she said her business has absolutely exploded. Now, is it timing? Is it the time of the year? We can absolutely, it's all part of it. When I said to her, why? She, she was up 30% up to the end of August. 30% in her business versus the entire year last year. And I said, why? And she said, because I start putting the value on myself and my clients and my workspace. I didn't put a big sign on the door saying, all asshole kids have now been kicked out. Come and sign up. I basically put a value. I asked these kids to be removed. The kids are not the problem. Parenting issues, whatever. I don't get into that one. And she put a value on her space and her business started to grow because she could speak about it in a different way. People felt it, people sensed it, people could feel the energy when they went into the room and her business has taken off. So that's an example of one real life example, which is very, very recent in the last four weeks. A lot of people, uh, especially younger entrepreneurs, uh, have gotten so into you know, automation, automating their life, that you can spend so much time automating your life to save time that, that the equation becomes unbalanced. and. I'm, I'm a big fan when I'm coaching people that you look at your not just time, uh, but space and, and also your attention and your energy. And, and if you're doing things like something stupid, booking your own travel, right? Well, who can't book their own travel? Like it's so simple to go to your favorite travel site and do all that stuff. Uh, well, it's not that simple if you realize that you're probably going to change your flight three times by the time you come home and that you're going to be stuck somewhere. <laughs> At that point, okay, it's going to cost you 25 bucks to work with a human being travel agent or whatever. But honestly, it was $25 and how much stress or energy did that save you? Do you find that the people, even the very successful people you're, you're working with are kind of nickel and diming themselves on, on things that are sucking their energy and their time? Is that part of the things that you do to help them value just that, that mojo or whatever it is? Or is that kind of outside the realm where you, you work with people? 
No, I do. I, do. I mean, I, I do cover that space. I mean, I often tell the story, uh, well, not often, but every so often about my wife, who doesn't appreciate me telling the story about one day we're sitting down. I said, why don't we sit down and watch a movie? And she goes, well, somebody's got to do the ironing. And I, and, and I, got, so I got that tone. And I said, uh, I said, well, I said, you want me to look after it? And she goes, well, what do you mean look after it? I mean, you're going to give it to somebody to, you know, to, 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 to do the ironing and you're going to pay for it. And I said, absolutely, because I believe my time is worth more than that. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't ask for permission to share this story, but uh, she's not here, so what about it? But anyway, um, so, so I, I said, can I just sit down? I said, what, what's, the re what's really going on here? Yeah. And ironically, this is, this is where the story went. It wasn't about the money that I would have given somebody to iron the clothes. It was basically, I said, if I got someone to iron our clothes on a regular basis, which I believe we should do, because I value my time, perhaps with respect more than you do, if you were to have that conversation, you were to tell somebody that you had somebody iron your clothes, who's the one person in the world you would not want to tell? And straight away, she just said, her mother. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it was all about what people thought. It was all about what her mother would say if she found out. It wasn't about the, the, the you know, what practically makes sense here, because you could do one email, you could sell send one, pro, you know, create one product, have one conversation, yeah. could make us the money for the year for ironing. But you don't do that. You're more concerned about what your mother might think if her daughter had some ironing person doing her clothes. I, I can tell you, I, I take great pleasure in knowing that uh, my wife, uh, a Karolinska trained physician with an MBA from the Stockholm School of Economics. I, I love it that she's doing my laundry. Wait, <laughs> it, just, it, it doesn't compute, right? But that, that same thing uh, plays through all of us in one way or another, right? So th there's times when I'm like, all right, I, I, should, I should go play with the kids. And then I said, hey, kids, let, let's go, like, you know, do something that's quasi fun. Like, you know, let's let's repair something. But I'm like, wait a minute. Like, honestly, I should just go out and we should, like, pick some berries and climb a tree and throw rocks or whatever. And that that's a better use of my time, even though, like, I want to do it. So I, I, I have the same messages. Playing, you know, if I don't, you know, install my own floors or whatever, <laughs> like, I'm not a good person. But uh, that's actually not true at all. And, and just seeing those for me and recognizing that it's happening in my body and then just being like, that's a total lie and setting it aside and then throwing rocks and picking berries. Uh, that's been really helpful just for my own ability to be a good entrepreneur because I have more energy when I do that. And I realize that I now I'm accepting help, whereas before I might have not accepted help. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think it, it applies equally well to, to women and men, but, but certainly I've had the very similar conversation with, with Dr. Lana about how like, well, okay, <laughs> if, if you really want to do laundry, all right, I, I'm not going to stop you, but for God's sake, isn't there a better way? Yeah, I, I, I have a saying that we give ourselves what we feel we deserve in life. And, and, and I honestly believe there's no true words that have come out of my mouth in the sense that uh, it's been proven time and time again. And when people start to shift that internal value and put a value on themselves, they start to then look on the peripheral, the outside of their lives, and they start to give themselves the, um, the freedom and, and, and they start to, to, to take up things that they want to do and they, start, and they drop things that they don't want to do. So when that value shifts internally, which is, which is a process, it takes time, everything on the outside makes you know, shifts automatically. It really does. So how many of, of your clients, when they start changing their internal way of valuing what they do and, and what they are looking for in life, how many of them find that they're... Uh, that their their partner or their spouse hasn't made the shift at the same time. It seems like that could be a really stressful thing. I mean, does success actually like harm relationships if if both people in the relationship aren't on the same page? Absolutely, brilliant question. Absolutely, brilliant question. There are so many partners of clients of mine who have never met me who hate my guts. Absolutely <laughs> hate my guts because they come back and well, this is not a sexist comment. They're certainly not designed to be. But initially, most of my clients would have been men. Um, just for whatever reason, maybe I, at the time I was being, I was harsher. I was maybe I was speaking to more. I don't know, but it was maybe ninety percent men. That's changed to sixty forty in favor of more women working with me now. Um, but initially, the, the response back would be, "Well, listen, these are things I could have told you. Why are you going off and spending money and spending time with this Irish guy? And sure, we, we could have, you know, all this stuff was going on because they felt threatened, or maybe legitimately they thought I was full of shit. Whatever, I don't know, but." It, it, interestingly enough, when they get through that phase of you know, that fear and they hit that tipping point where they actually let go of their own insecurities, which are all it's driven by a lot of their own insecurities, and they actually start to recognize that actually their partner is fundamentally shifting. I don't mean a different person, but I mean there's, there's a real evident shift. There's a calmness that comes with these people. There's a confidence. There's, a, there's an awareness. There's an openness. There's a more vulnerable conversation happening at home. Then they start to lean in and say, okay, 
how can I get a part of this? So what's really interesting is they go from the dislike and distrust and the nervousness and the insecurity and I don't want my partner to change to I want some of this because I can see the shift. And the way I describe it sometimes is like climbing a mountain. And uh, I say this in the most, and try not to be condescending because my, my, I love, my wife is amazing, but she would admit to this as well, is that when I started to climb the, the, the mountain of life, if you want to call it, she was nervous. She didn't know what to do. And I started exposing myself to stuff that, honestly, probably two years earlier, I would have thought was weird. And I look back the mountain and I look down and she didn't want to, she didn't want to, she didn't want to climb. She didn't want to go there. She didn't know how to. She didn't want to. She was nervous. So, of course, I went back, tried to pick her up, metaphorically speaking, push her up or pull her up with a rope, all of which will negate the journey for both of us. And eventually I just had to let it go. And I had to trust that if I'm bettering myself, I'm going to better my relationship. And there was one day, I remember literally not looking back at the mountain, but one day she came to me and she says, I want to do some of my own personal growth. I want to step in. Where do I start? And I remember, Dave, it was incredible. And the conversations that we've had since then, and anyone who knows us knows that we're not perfect, our relationship, but we are very, very, very close. And it requires energy and effort and, and challenging conversations. And I've been working with couples for 10 years. It's something I didn't share with you, but I've been working with couples for 10 years. It's, a, it's an interesting dynamic, but it's primarily driven by control. Uh, we often get attracted to somebody who's the opposite of who we are and then we spend the next 5, 10 or 15 years trying to change that person to be like us <laughs> and yeah. see the world like we do and do the things that we want to do. And it's actually, if you can celebrate both individuals, they create complete, two completely different entities and paths and authentic beings, then it's the communication that keeps people together. So that's what I normally experience. So I've spent a lot of time in the last two years uh, around other successful entrepreneurs. And part of that is because when you spend time with other people who are doing things in the similar spaces and all you learn from them, but it also just kind of ups your game. Uh, so I've noticed that there are a lot of people, especially people who've had recent success, who have relationship stress because you know, the, just as you're describing, one person kind of starts to quote, pull ahead, but, but they're basically just, just bringing it. And the other person's made really uncomfortable. And this can be men or women. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I think it might even be tougher when the woman starts to be successful because there's all these messages about masculinity for men and, and whatnot. Uh, but w whichever way a, a couple is 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 working, uh, it, it seems like it's almost like a spring. You know, one person goes and then the string, spring stretches and either the, the partner who isn't moving starts to move or the spring breaks. Uh, but it is a stressor, no doubt about it. I'm, I, I had something similar, too. Um, in my case, I, I focus most of my personal growth on neurofeedback and other sort of biohacking things uh, because it's the fastest that I've found for me. And I remember the day very well when, uh, when Lana said, you know, I, I think I want to do 40 years then. <laughs> I'm like, I've been waiting for you to do this for five years. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the changes start happening. And it, it's, it's really cool because it, it's important. And... This is something that I never see written about in business books and in books on success and all that stuff is what happens when you're successful? What happens to your relationship? And that's something that, that you're, I'd say, more aware of than most of the people that, I, that I've worked with. Uh, so in, any other advice for people who are planning to kick some ass and are already in a relationship? Like, like what should you do to, to, to bulletproof your relationship uh, so as you become successful, you both move maybe more in lockstep? Well, I think one of the most common things I see is people uh, dilute their success. They dilute their aspirations and they, and they play small and they start kind of, you know, slow down because they're afraid of losing their partner. And ultimately that leads to resentment and um, resentment towards themselves, resentment towards the relationship. And ultimately it comes back to haunt you. You have to go on your own path. And I, the, the analogy I always, always use is the mountain. You have to climb that mountain, whatever it is, whether it's a new business, um, you know, a book, whatever that is. And you have to trust that if it's aligned, that, that that relationship will, that spring will, will come together. And you have to let your, your, your partner go. You have to let that person go. Um, I, it's funny, when I when I do work with couples, I often ask them to come with, uh, you know, maybe a couple of things they want to change about their about their partner. And often they'll arrive at this weekend and they'll, they'll have a list, a laundry list of the things and they're kind of like rolling up their sleeves and going, now here we go, here's my opportunity to change my partner. Um, and what we do is we, 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 we basically drop that completely and we get them to delve into, you know, some of their, you know, how they, how they grew up around, talk about money, how they grew up around relationships. What was your relation to, relationship to relationships? And they go, what an odd question. But we start delving in, like what they witnessed, what they grew up around, because that's basically what has trained them. 
And as, that, as their partner witnesses, not just what they're experiencing themselves in terms of their relationship to relationships historically, but their partner, they, competition and anger and frustration is often replaced by compassion and understanding. They end up coming away with the laundry list that they brought every single time. I've never seen it change. And they literally go like this, rip it up and they go, <laughs> you know what? That's not the issue. The issue is here. I've got to deal with my stuff. Yeah. So my greatest, strongest plea to people is not forget about your wife, forget about your husband, or you forget about your partner. It's not about that, but it's about absolutely you have to go for what's in your soul. You have to. Um, because if you don't, it'll come back and it'll haunt you. And you think t- temporarily you're protecting your relationship, you're not. You're setting yourself up for a, for a fall eventually. Um, you know, and, and I think that just isn't necessary. You said something amazing. People tear up their list of wants. What I find when I work with entrepreneurs and even just in my own path of, of you know, the last 20 years, knowing what you want versus what you are supposed to want. For most people, it, 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 it's a, not the same. You ask them what they want and they'll, they'll answer the way they were taught to answer. But they aren't even clear when you really kind of scrape off all the programming. Oftentimes it's a big question mark. How do you help people clear away the fog around understanding what they actually want versus what they think they want? Yeah, it's a great, great, great question. And again, this is you know what we think we want up here, which is a lot of our, I see this with goal setting and vision boards and yeah. everything else. And, and uh, I, I, I'd rather work with somebody who has no goals whatsoever than a list, a laundry list of goals that are unauthentic and things that they think they want because they heard somebody speak about it or they read a book on success. And I think that's one of the challenges in a world today where there's so much information that we're, we're taking the pieces that we think, um, but we're not necessarily checking and say, are they aligned to who I am? So what I call is intuitive clarity. And the intuitive clarity of what, what, what everyone needs to do or wants to do or, or what's in their soul is within them. It's not me. I don't have the answer. So the first thing I do is I call bullshit with my clients. And I say, you keep telling me you don't know what you want, but I call bullshit. I call absolute clear bullshit. And it, they, I've proved it time and time again, literally in 20 minutes with a client. You go after, I'll give you one quick example. An entrepreneur says, oh, you know, I've got this software business. It's going really well. I'm making tons of dough. But I know, I just know I'm a current. You keep going after me. And I know in my heart and soul it's not what, what I'm aligned to. I know it's not my passion project. And this guy has a gift that, you know, his talent is, is, is uh, his, his software business, but his gift is something else. And, um, and I just turned around and I said, uh, well, what would you do if you were to bring in a passion project to, to kind of supplement maybe the business that isn't kind of lighting you up? And he says, oh, I don't know. And I said, bullshit. And I said, get on that board up there. And I put him on this board in front of all these other entrepreneurs. And we said, just so we're clear, we're not leaving this room until you, do, you write it all up. And he goes, but I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. I said, bullshit. And we kept Adam and Adam and Adam. And I, I, I should, you know, literally when he started, he started drawing this concept. And it was all about stillness for young kids to help them with confidence and self-esteem and everything else. And literally when he stopped and put his pen down and everyone looked around, people had their jaws open because he created this vision. And he looked back and said, I have no idea where that came from. And then my final question is, where would the location be? He goes, I don't know. And, I, and he looks at me and he knows what's coming next. And he goes, okay, okay. And he picks an exact location, almost a street in Toronto. Wow. He knew it was all there, but he's afraid of putting it out because of the implications, because the world now knows. What does he have to change? What does he have to give up? We're obsessed with holding on. Uh, now, when you say he's afraid, he didn't know he was afraid though, right? He, he, this stuff was so, he was so afraid, this stuff was hidden entirely. And this is what I, I do with a lie detector stuck to my head. <laughs> like if, if I'm afraid of something, I rely on an external piece of tech to tell me that there's something there so I can dig for it because it's invisible. The fact that, that people are listening to this, I, hopefully they're, they're going, this is, this is interesting <laughs> because if there are things there that are invisible to you because of your fear versus things, oh, I know I'm afraid of that. I know I'm afraid of heights, so I'm not going to go on the, the Ferris wheel or whatever. That's a conscious fear, and those are trivial. It's the unconscious fears that just completely screw up your life. They screw up your business. They screw up everything. Other than putting people on stage and making them draw it until there's probably enough stage fright, enough fear of being exposed that they finally just push through and then they see it, what are the other techniques that, that you might recommend to people, either in your book or just in your coaching practice, to figure out what they're afraid of that they don't know they're afraid of? 
Dave, it's a big question. I mean, people keep saying to me, you know, how, how do you leverage your business? How, many, how are you going to get other coaches in to do the work and everything else? I don't. What I do is I do small live experiences, okay. intimate experiences, and that's my specialty. My lie detector is these pair of eyes here. I can look at somebody's eyes, yeah. and I know they're bullshitting me, and I know they're bullshitting somebody else. So 95% of my business, if not more, is live one-to-one. 16 people in Ireland, 20 people next month we're going to Peru. You know, all these nice. live experiences. And I sit with these people. I feel their energy i feel i look in their eyes i work intently with them honestly if i was to sit here and give you three tips or three things or three strategies i would need honestly i i, I they don't come to me truthfully okay. um, I'm, I'm not saying i couldn't come up with a few i am um, i think just on a really simple level i think uh is, is, get, is really just questioning what you say you want. Like even just sitting down and saying, no, no, I want to build a multi-million dollar business. I want this, I want that. I sat with an entrepreneur recently and we did this half-day session thing and he sat there and he was telling me about this, all these plans. And I just sat back and he said, I said, great, great, it looks fantastic. And I can see how you can rationalize it beautifully. I see you have it all. Pl-. I said, I just got one simple question. I said, why? He goes, why what? Have you been listening to me? I said, you know, and I've been listening. I know where that fits in there and that business fits but, but why are you doing why 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 are you doing it all? What what's I don't get it. I'm not saying it's not there. I just want you to because my job is to call bullshit. It's easy to tell people what they want to hear. It is so easy to massage people's egos, tell them what they want to hear, and send them home fired up and ready to go. It is very difficult to tell people what they don't want to hear because you get a lot of kickback for that. You get a lot of hatred. You get a lot of anxiety. A lot of yeah. frustration. But eventually those people will break through something and it'll bring them to a different phase of life that they w- was unattainable to them. And that entrepreneur had no idea, Dave. He had no idea why he was creating this complexity because he was so scared of stopping. He's yeah. so scared of the silence and the space. And he needs to keep busy because he doesn't have anything from an identity standpoint outside of his, rela- outside of his work. He's uncomfortable in his own skin, doesn't have great relationships at home, tells himself he does, tells everybody he's great relationships with his wife and his kids, so never assume the relationships you think are great are great. Always call bullshit on yourself. That's probably my greatest in, in, in advice. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good really good thing. And, and having good friends who can do that or uh, therapists, coaches, uh, it, it's, it's terribly important because the, the biggest mistake that I, I probably made other than just eating like crap so my basic biology didn't work uh, was that I was very unaware of any of that kind of stuff you, you just talked about. So I, I would tell myself things were a certain way and I would just pretend they were no, no matter what. And that actually wasn't serving me very well. And it means you get surprised in ways you don't like. Like you don't make the million dollars you should have made on that deal. In fact, you make nothing. And, and things like that happen because of that self-deception. So my, my powers of self-deception are so high that I don't trust myself to notice them. Uh, I rely on other people or technology or both. Uh, and I don't believe I would have the relationship success, the financial success, the career, any of the things that, that I have been just most most fruitful and amazing um, had I not taken that step to just say, all right, I, I need some help on this. Yeah, and you do. You need somebody. I mean, there's yeah. people listening here, all, all different parts of the world, and you know, find somebody who will just who will call the bullshit. And when you stand up to them, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges I find, um, you know, with with leaders in business is that people aren't challenging them. They'll challenge them to a point when the leader kicks back, the the person challenging them will back away. So find a coach or therapist, somebody that is prepared to dig in even further when you lash back at them, because entrepreneurs. And, and really driven people tend to be quite, you know, aggressive and they tend to be, you know, really strong and, and, and they push back really hard. But you need somebody that's able to come back and continue to dig in. And if you have that person in your life, you know, that's a valuable asset. It, it really is. And I, I would go so far, and I want to see if you agree, as to say it probably shouldn't be your significant other, your spouse. They, they can do it sometimes, but if it's their job all the time, it's probably going to be uncomfortable. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, the okay. person that you need is somebody who's unrelated, you know, unattached to the outcome, yeah. financially, physically, or emotionally. And uh, you know, you can go to your brother or your dad, and and they might have the most phenomenal head on them, and they might be so grounded and so intelligent, and a great entrepreneur and a great business person, all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, it's coming from a place of being attached to you emotionally, wanting the best for you, and not necessarily them putting you in a risky, a risky environment. So somebody who's completely unattached to the outcome, financially, physically, and, and, and emotionally, is is, is critical important it is we're coming up on the end of the show and 
I want to talk about a couple things before we, we end. Uh, the first one is about money not buying happiness. What's your take on that? Does it, does it buy happiness or not? Oh, you're looking I get the feeling you're looking for a yes or no answer on this one. Um, I, I think it can I can think it can give us experiences. Um, I think it can it can give us the, the, the ability to create experiences. But what I know about experiences is the difference between doing and being happy. Doing happy are things like holidays and and, and you know going off and spending a month here and, and, and going to the circus and going to Cirque du Soleil and all these sort of things. But they're doing and they're and they're great feelings and they make you feel emotionally very engaged. But um, I, I, if I had to say, does money buy happiness, yes or no? I've traveled enough in the world. I've seen enough different things. If I had to someone put a gun to my head right now and said, does it yet, if it's a yes or no, I would have to say no. Um, I'm also dealing with extremely wealthy clients on paper. Um, and you know, some of, like literally some of the wealthiest yeah, families yeah. in America. And I fly down to, to L.A. and work with these families in December again. And um, I'm not saying they're unhappy. Um, but I just don't think that perhaps the, the cost of the economic success and the business success has come perhaps um, on, a, on a dilution of, of maybe core relationships and depth of relationships and comfortableness with their own skin. So my answer, Dave, would have to be, no, I don't believe it does if it was a yes or no answer. And that was a long way wind, winded answer. I, to I, it, it's exactly the, the length of answer I, I was looking for uh, because it, it's not black or white. You know, if you're starving to death, it's much harder to be happy. Uh, one of the things that, that I learned was, was making $6 million sure made me feel really happy, but I wasn't actually that happy. I was just happy that I made some money finally. And I've actually been happier after I lost the money, uh, although I would have liked to have kept it. Uh, well, I, well I, think, yeah. I think that's interesting because it speaks to your previous point about, you know, people don't know, they're unaware and, and they're blind to the reality. So someone will sit in front of you and go, I listen, they'll be listening to this interview and say, this is a lot of crap. I mean, I've got 10 million in the bank and now I'm happier than I've ever been. But like, who's there challenging, challenging them to the core? Who's there saying, so you're saying you're happy, where in your life? And how do you know you're happy? And digging in, I had a lady recently who said, I'm, you know, I have a great relationship with my kids. And I just turned around and said, how do you know? And she goes, well, they're my kids. And she starts getting a bit pissed off. And I said, yeah, well, let's talk about it. Turns out the relationship wasn't that great because she was benchmarking it on previous relationships and, and comparing against her neighbors. But now she's somewhere to go with it. Now she got, she's got something to do, even though it was sad to face the reality that it wasn't quite as good as she thought. Yeah, benchmarking, that's a whole other conversation we could have. But we're out of time. So only two more questions left. Number one, where can people find you? Your URL, the, the title of your book, where they should go to buy it, things like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Philip McKernan uh, with one L, Philip, uh, M-C-K-E-R-N-A-N.com. So philipmckernan.com. And then the book is uh, richonpaperbook.com is the URL for the actual book. And it's on Amazon and so on, different parts of the world. It's definitely worth reading because the, the longer I've lived, the more I've worked with, with clients. I, not, I don't think nearly quite as many as you, but certainly some, some wealthy, some not. The, the, the idea that it's your relationship with, with money in there that, that really, really determines your economic success more than anything else, and that you can have lots of money and be super unhappy or vice versa. Uh, they're both totally true, but getting those aligned has, has been powerful for me and, and for those I know who've done it. So pick up the book. It, it's worth a read. The final question is one that all guests uh, get asked, and that is, given all the things that you've, that you've learned, all the things you've done, including caddying for a president, getting run over by elephants just about, and all the other things, three most important recommendations for people who want to perform better in life, not necessarily at work or anything else, but you want to kick more ass, what do you do? Okay, I think number one is, um, in no particular order, I think number one is never put anybody on a pedestal. Um, no matter who they are, never okay. ever put another human on a pedestal. When you put somebody on a pedestal an inch or a mile high, you're saying one thing and one, one thing only, uh, that you're not good enough or you're not as good as them. So never ever, always respect people. Respect people in a position that you're not in. Respect people in a position you'd like to get to. All that stuff, absolutely. But never put them on a pedestal. Never believe they're better than you. Critical. Uh, mistake I made for many, many years. The other one is uh, slightly deep, but I would, I would encourage everybody to understand their story. Uh, people often think that you know, to improve their future, they've got to focus on the future. We're so future focused, it's extraordinary. People want to, are, are, are obsessed about being present, and that's fair enough. But if you want to understand what's dictating your future, look at your past. Because your past is, as I say, you know, your past has created your present, and your present is creating your future. Understand who you are. Understand why you behave the way you do. Understand why you think and how you think the way you do. And it'll give you 
an incredible insight and awareness and understanding of where you're going in the future. Um, they'd, be, they'd, be, they'd be the top two. And um, that's probably all I, I've got for you right now in terms of number three. And I could go with so many different areas. But uh, number three is, uh, you know, Go, you know, the whole area of goal setting, the whole area of, of, of you know, mapping out your future and everything else and the authenticity of your goals is, is not just create a goal that you think you want, but really understand why you want to delve in and really, really consider why it is you want the thing you say you want in your head. Because the amount of people that I meet every single day that have sets of goals that are not belong to themselves, and what happens is they spend five or 10 or 15 years chasing them. They get to the top of that mountain and they just go, okay, this is not exactly the feeling I thought it would be. And then they look across the horizon, they see the next mountain, they go, hang on a second now, now that's the mountain I need to climb. If they can climb that mountain, then I'll be happy. But the reality is that passion follows them for life because the reality is the mountain they climbed is not authentic. So question what you say you want to the core and, and just keep asking why it is you want it because that will serve you in the long term and it will also solidify and validate to make sure that you are on the right track if you are. Uh, Philip McKernan, thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio today. If you're listening, if you're listening today and uh, you got some value from this, I'd appreciate it if you would do one thing. Go to Amazon and buy Philip's book and then click pre-order on the Bulletproof Diet book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, and the reason for that is that Philip's book is absolutely worth reading and I'm really working on pre-sales for my book and if these podcasts are valuable for you, it just takes a minute. It's on sale and I'd appreciate it. And you can buy one, get the other one. They'll be paired together and then everyone will see both books and they're both worth reading. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. If you've been listening to this podcast and you're wondering where to start, why don't you just jump in with both feet? Check out the Bulletproof Total Upgrade Kit, which is available on UpgradedSelf.com. In order to make Bulletproof coffee, the first step is to brew it using the right beans. Upgraded coffee beans are something that I created for the highest possible mental and physical performance. It's coffee that's processed differently than other coffee. It tastes even better than normal coffee, but it gives you a very different mental feeling 